quiet, please. Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called Clarissa. No. He was dead before the fire started. I've told you that a dozen times. No, I can't prove it, of course not. It... You just have to believe me. Take my word for it. I can't prove he was dead. You can't prove he wasn't. And anyway, what difference does it make now? I'm sorry. I, I can't hear you very well. Yes. Well, all right. It was an old black shell of a house. A house that has lived too long. A house where the floors groaned in pain at night, where the windows shuddered at the gentlest touch of the wind. Where door latches suddenly gave up their grip and let the night come sniffing into the house to paw at your eyes and wake you to the other silences that lay around you. It was never warm there. In the winter, old Heinz kept a fire going in the fireplace in the old sitting room, but the, the logs were scrawny and the draft was bad and and the flames seemed to grudge us their warmth so that we shivered all through the day. We're glad when night came and we could escape to the meager comfort of the drafty bedrooms. And in the summer, there was a dampness about the place. An unhealthy clamminess drifted from the walls and stirred uneasily among the ancient smells of decay that clung to the place. Well, I suppose you could call old... Heinz, a, a character. You said you didn't know him? An immigrant from the Rhineland sometime in the early 70s. Uh, that would make him, uh, let me see, how old? Ich war im Rheinland geboren. In der Jahrzeit 1862. That's right, uh, 1862. He was an old man, but he never appeared old. You might have taken him for a vigorous man of 60. His hair and his scraggly mustache were jet black. I suspect he dyed them regularly. And his blue eyes seemed as keen as those of a boy of 18. And he'd never been away from the house for a single night, he used to say, from the day he bought it and moved into it in 1888. And it was an old house then. Yes, I spent some very dreary days and nights in that house. Huh? I couldn't afford a better place to live. Well, no, people don't go to live in a haunted house if they can find another place, you know. Well, yes, of course I'd heard it was haunted before I went there to live. Do you believe in haunted houses? No. Neither did I, of course. Well, I agree, it did look like a haunted house. I told you about the sounds in the night. I mean, I told you about some of the sounds in the night. Yes, of course, there were other sounds. Well, please, let me tell it my own way. Well, Clarissa, for instance. Clarissa in particular. Clarissa, above everything else. I had lived there nearly a year. Heinz and I sat that first night alongside the fireplace. I remember he'd asked me to share a bottle of Ben Custler Doctor with him. We sat in front of the stingy little fire. And there was a kerosene lamp on the table and Heinz in his old black coat with the sleeves that were too short. You like the wine then, Jesse? Yeah, very much. Very much. I have not much left. This is from before the war when it was easier to get, you see, but... Now, well, it is almost to your last. 
You shouldn't be so generous with it, Heinz. Oh, no, no. Good wine always schmeckt besser. When with a friend you drink it, nicht wahr? A, a little more? <laughs> Not for a moment, thanks. Yes, to sit by the fire and look down into the coals and see images of the things past. And drink wine and see the images grow clearer. Ah, it is good in the old age. You've lived here alone for a long time? Yeah, a long time. Long, long time. I'm used to it. Used to the lights and the little fire and the silences. Yes. It is cold for this time of the year. Uh, listen. I suppose. Oh, I thought I heard someone singing. So? Did you hear anything? It is Clarissa. What did you say? Clarissa, my daughter. Oh, I didn't know you had a daughter, Heinz. Yes. Uh, Mr. Morvine. Uh, no, thanks. I... I haven't seen her around. No. Well, is she... Excuse me, Heinz. Uh, you will forgive me, Jesse. Uh, she's a child. I do not wish you to be bothered. Why, she wouldn't bother me, Heinz. I like children. Uh, there's enough left here in the bottle for one more for each of us, huh? Thank you, Heinz. And yes, schlaf wohl. And I drank the last of the wine with the old man. And then I climbed the creaking stairs to the dreary little room, carrying the kerosene lamp in one hand and casting fabulous shadows on the peeling wallpaper. Seeing the ancient plush-covered rocking chair nodding away at me as I entered the room, as if a startled occupant had suddenly deserted it at the sound of my footsteps on the stairs. And the cold spring rain drenching the window panes. And the murmured complaints of the beams and rafters of the old house. The pleasant, musty fumes of the wine I had drunk kept sleep away for a while when I'd blown out the lamp. And the melody of that children's song flowed again across my mind as I lay there. My thoughts wandered to the lonely child that dwelt in the haunted house with the old man and the newcomer student. I smiled to myself as I thought. Now that settles the question of the house being haunted, doesn't it? People have heard the little girl singing to herself in the night. They've not known that a little girl lived here too. And, well, that's the ghost. And I smiled again at superstitions. And another idle thought struck me. I wondered at the child's age. Ten or twelve years old by the sound of her voice. And somewhere in the back of my drowsy mind, I seemed to remember that Heinz had told me that Elena, his wife, had died... When was it the year of the San Francisco earthquake? Well, that would be 1906. That would be 42 years ago. And this was a child of 10 or 12. I must have been mistaken. I was getting sleepy. The wine, the rain. The dark. Yeah, my wife is French. 
she taught the song to Clarissa. Oh? Yeah, it is an old song. How old is your daughter, Heinz? Eh? How old? Oh, she is young. Is she pretty? Oh, yeah. Uh, your breakfast? Uh, coffee. I found it on the stove. Clarissa made it. Oh, did she? Mm, you'd better go to work now, huh? Yes, I suppose so. Uh, you don't need to keep the little girl out of sight on my account, Heinz. I like children. Oh, she bother you. Oh, no, I've got a little sister back home. Oh, yeah? Miriam. She's 11. Uh, Clarissa is older. Oh? Miriam's got bright yellow hair. Clarissa has dark hair. Yeah, I, uh, I got a picture of her here. Oh, so? Oh, yeah. she's very pretty. I have no picture of Clarissa. No, oh, that's too bad. Uh, I'll see you tonight, huh? Yes? Yes, yeah, sure, Hyde. I should have let the thing drop then and there. If the old man felt that children should be kept away from adults, that was his privilege, of course. And although I was often lonely for other company than the old man, I was a dweller in his house, naturally subject to his wishes. My work? No, I never left the place. Uh, my book? Oh, I was writing a book. No, not very exciting. Mathematics, I have some theories. No, the book is gone. The fire, you remember? I could understand Heinz. I thought he obviously had a great respect for a man's work, especially a work of such apparent erudition. I must not be disturbed. I might stay in my room day and night with my slide rules and my profile paper and my broken flower pot full of sharpened pencils. I was not to be disturbed. But how many times I wished for the happy sound of my little sister Miriam's gay laughter. I found myself listening for the lilt of the little girl song that she used to sing. And that Clarissa knew too. Heinz mentioned Clarissa... Occasionally. I sometimes wish that I could have sent Clarissa to school, Jesse. Well, it's too bad you didn't. Mm, always there was never enough money. Why, oh, there are schools. Public schools, Heinz. No, not for Clarissa's free schools. You know, I wonder. Wonder? Well, you know, uh, children are supposed to go to school. I'm surprised that the school authorities haven't been to see about sending her. The police? Oh, no, no. Not the police. But there are laws about schools. I mean, you might find yourself in trouble if they discover you have a daughter of school age. They will come here. Well, if they find out. Jesse, you will not tell. Well, now, look here, Heinz. Uh, you're not being fair to the child. Uh, yes, yes. No, really, I mean it. Uh, hasn't she ever been to school? Well, I, I teach her a little. Well, Heinz, uh, it's none of my business. But you're doing her a very serious harm. No, no. Listen, Jesse. You don't tell anybody about her. Well, I don't know, Heinz. If they come and ask me... Jesse, listen. I, I tell you something. Well? Clarissa can't go to school. Well, why not? I, I told you it doesn't cost anything. It is not that. Well, then? She's... She's not well... Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Heinz. Uh, look, uh, would you like it if I gave her a little of my time and, and taught her some of the elements? No, no, please don't. Well, I'd be glad to. No. Well, have it your way, Heinz. I don't mean to run too on your affairs, but after all, a, a child... I'm sorry, Jesse. I thank you, but no. All right. Forget it. Sometimes I could hear her song, 
far away somewhere in the dank recesses of that crumbling house. And my thoughts revolved again about this mystery. Heinz said she was not well. Heinz would not allow her to appear. Was Clarissa some misshapen monster child that she must be pent up and never see the sun? Was she... I detest mysteries of that kind. I love the good, clean mysteries of abscissa and ordinate, the logarithm and anti-logarithm of the calculus and the grand old theorems devised by the ancients. But the fascinating mysteries of the human mind and of human behavior are alien to me. They my hate. And my thoughts crept further and further away from the ten numbers as doubt and speculation about the child laid hold of my mind. In the night, how often I heard her sobs, I thought, sometimes close outside my door. And yet when I opened the door, there was nothing. And old Heinz grew more and more taciturn. He never spoke of his daughter. He seemed to avoid me by day and to disappear by night. But the summer came then, and the fall, and winter. My book was going badly. And my thoughts wandered. I must leave this place, I thought, or find out this mystery. And again I asked the old man if there was not something I might do for this pathetic child, this invisible, haunting voice. No, Jesse. There is nothing you could do. But Christmas is coming, Heinz. Uh, what can I get her for Christmas? No, why not, Jesse? What? My Helene... She died on the eve of Christmas. Well, uh, but Heinz, you owe it to the child. No. But let us not speak of it again. But to me, the thought of Christmas passing by this child was unspeakable. I determined that if the old man would do nothing about it, I would. You know, I had little money, and there was so little I could do. But I did come into the town here, and I found a toy for her. I, I found one I could afford a little woolly lamb. A little woolly white lamb with black buttons for eyes and a, a blue silk ribbon about its neck and a gay little blue flower in its mouth. Well, I hung a little card about its neck that said, Merry Christmas to Clarissa. And on Christmas Eve, Heinz and I shared the last bottle of Ben Costler Doctor before the miserly little fire. And I gave him one of the handkerchiefs my little sister Miriam had sent me and he gave me an old stone crude with a heavy pewter top that he said came from Heidelberg. And we regretted that there was no creamy Pilsner Urquell to drink from it. Wished each other a happy Christmas. And then, in the night, I was awakened by a tiny sound. And I lay awake silently for a moment. And there was another sound. A hesitant little footstep. And a rustling at the dresser across the room from me. And I lay quietly and listened. <laughs> Is that you, Clarissa? Is that you, Clarissa? I realized 
But this was what had been plucking at the corners of my mind. And I was happy now that I knew she really lived. But I was not living in the midst of fantasy. I had wondered what Heinz would say. He was perfectly natural about it. It was good of you, Jesse. Good? <laughs> what? To find a gift for Clarissa. Oh, <laughs> did you like it? Ah. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm glad. Uh, she asked me to say, Dr. Shane, to you. Well, then I say, Dr. Shane? Ah, that is good. You're a kind person, Jesse. <laughs> I wish it could have been more. Oh, it is a very rich gift. Never has she had such a thing. <laughs> uh, is she going to have Christmas dinner with us, Heinz? No. So, I had won a little victory in this conflict with the darkness. But I was to go no further. I asked Heinz about her. Heinz answered shortly. I suggested that a birthday gift might be in order if I only knew her birthday. I proposed writing to my own sister and begging her for out warm storybooks that Clarissa might read, even if she must stay aloof from the rest of the house. Heinz did not reply. Everything was as it had always been, so long as the name of Clarissa was not mentioned. But only came in the late spring when it was cold and windy again, and the raw snow pelted against the windows and the whole house shivered. I heard her crying again in the night. And there was a quality in her voice this time that brought me out of the bed and into the hall. I called in alarm. Clarissa! I stepped back into my room and lit the kerosene lamp. And as I stepped out again toward the hallway... Heinz confronted me. What's my hand say, Jesse? Why can't you hear her, Heinz? Something's wrong, she said. No, go back by your room, Jesse. Oh, but Heinz. No, Peter, Jesse. Go back. Now, Heinz, listen to me. Something's awfully wrong with that child, and I, I will take care of her, Jesse. Please, Ma. In your room. Now, see here. I, I take care of my own man, huh? Heinz. <laughs> Uh, uh, a 
Mr. Darrell. No, no. Hear me. See, the key to Clarissa's room. You take it. Oh, is she all right? Hi. <gasps> Too late for me now. Go. Clarissa's room. Do what is to be done. <clears throat> I lifted him to the bed. I bent over him. I listened for his heart. There was no sound. Heinz was dead. Yes, just as I told you before, he died. He died there in my room, yes. What? Oh, yes. In the little half-light, I found the kerosene lamp and I lit it. I took the key... From the floor where he dropped it. No. I found the room very easily. It was at the far end of the hall. I called. Clarissa? Clarissa? And there was no answer. So I unlocked the door. And holding the light above my head, I walked over to the bed. And there, lying on the bed... Dressed in a pinafore that might have come out of the ten-year drawing in Alice in Wonderland. Crutching a little woolly lamb to her breast, there lay a tiny old, old woman with long white hair braided into pigtails. Clarissa. And I knew why I hadn't heard the little song for two days. And so when the lamp dropped out of my hand and the flames started licking around the dry-as-dust draperies and the fragile old oaken boards on the floor, I turned and went out of the house. Well, what else was there to do? The house had lived too long and so had the father and daughter who dwelt there.